All right, welcome back to War Seats in the House. Mike Russo, Anthony LaPanta. We're here uh, live at Elsie's Packed House. Appreciate everybody coming on out. Our next live show is March 13th. That is at Split Rocks, March 13th at Split Rock. We'll be back here at Elsie's on uh, March 27th. There's so many things that everybody that listens to this podcast knows that pisses me off about LaPanta. Um, so first one is that I already in my head had a fine for you to be late and you literally walked in five seconds before it turned seven o'clock yeah, you accused me of being phone. late i showed you my phone it said 659 and then it turned to seven second you were a hundred dollar fine right away was going toward the uh worst seats in the house fund and uh so that pissed me off that we you weren't late yeah we started it tonight um, um, how about this can we start how about every f-bomb that you have to go back and edit brandon is a contribution to the fund that's that, true that sounds i don't good. swear um <laughs> So that that and then the other thing that pisses me off is you're the only person I know that can go to the dentist for the first time in 14 years and not have a cavity, not need a root canal, you know, get praised by your hygienist, everything. Well, the first hygienist didn't praise me. It got better as the day went on. But it with the for the appointment maker was a little stunned when she said put in my information and said, "Is it possible you haven't been here since 2009?" I said, "Yes." And then when I got in and sat in the chair, she said, so where were you going in between? I said, no way. to my bathroom with a toothbrush every couple times a day. But uh, so she scared me a little bit, like making it sound like my teeth were about to fall out. I was going to need gum surgery. But then the next lady who came in, I can't remember what their titles were. And then the dentist that followed, they made it sound like I had the, like, I'm shocked how healthy your teeth are. This is great. <laughs> it's, you know, I think we could do a. We're going to do a deep cleaning, and then actually one of them wanted to get me Invisalign because they said my teeth weren't hitting squarely or something, but they're showing me all these models of my teeth, and yeah, worked out all right. Still, I wish they were drilling. I was shocked when I saw your practice today. <laughs> I, I was like, so, like there's no I way. I feel your karma while I was in the chair. Yeah, I know. If if um if they do the deep cleaning, can I be the one to get in there? <laughs> uh, no numbing agents, everything. Because uh, the deep scaling actually isn't a fun process out here. Um, all right. So I just got back from Winnipeg. That was a long drive. Well, didn't you just go to the dentist? Maybe. Yeah. I have to still call to get my appointments. It's multiple that I need follow up. Um, so uh, I, I offered you a ride back last night. Uh, you I didn't declined. take it. I that, did decline. I, it, it was a fun day in the in the car with Dylan. Uh, you know, uh, I bet Dylan would have a different opinion. <laughs> <laughs> when I dropped him off, I'm like, I bet this was a. For, we got to actually Fargo, and I said to Dylan, I'm like, you want to just continue south to South Dakota? And he's like, no. I thought maybe he was going to call an Uber and just catch his own ride <laughs> yeah. the rest of the way. Um, but man, was that a uh, was that a um, weird game last night? Don't you think? I mean, it, it was. was like it was like one of those games where it's like you know they're playing okay. I thought they were probably a little too praise I, I thought they gave themselves a little too much praise after the game about how well they were offensively but that's a game that if they probably get a save or two they need probably, a save yeah it, it was they a, were i thought they were the better team for the first two periods i thought winnipeg was better for the first eight minutes of the third and that was where they delivered the knockout punch but that's part of the game and it's it's something it was similar to the vancouver game where i thought the wild were playing really well but they vancouver cashed in on their chances early in that game and it kind of had the same feel with Winnipeg, but it, that team, they're the best defensive team in the league for a reason. They made it tough on the Wild, and even though the Wild were the better club, it wasn't like they had a plethora of grade-A chances. And, yeah, they needed a save. The The second goal was a backbreaker because if even with the power play goal, if you're only down one zip mm -hmm. and the way you're playing, they've shown throughout this last stretch that that hasn't knocked them off their game. But when you give up two and 14 seconds, that's tough. and then as good as they were in the second period, to just not be able to get the second one and get back within one going into the third, and then I felt it was going to be a tall task. Let's rewind for a second and go back to that Vancouver game. I mean, it was one of the probably most fun games that Wild fans have ever seen, whether you're watching on TV or, or in person. Tell everybody from your perspective that got to call 17 goals in that game and on a front end of a back-to-back, -back, yet you still had your voice last night, sudden, shockingly. Uh, but what was that whole experience like for you? Yeah, it was unreal. It, really, it was. It's there's no way to describe it. Margot asked me when I got home if I had ever called a game with that many goals, and I I couldn't remember one. 
even in high school hockey. I just, I've never seen anything like that. And to have it happen at the end in the NHL with two teams that the first times they had played, there'd only been four goals scored total in the two games. The goalies were 96 and a half percent. And then in this game, it was like a 50, 50 proposition. Anytime you threw a puck toward the net, <laughs> if it was going to find the back or not. And I, it was, there was a moment when, when Vancouver went up four, one, I really felt like it was trouble. I thought this is going to, now they're just going to lock it down. It's going to end up 4-1. Neither team is going to have a chance the rest of the way. But when Minnesota had made it 4-2, even when Vancouver scored to make it 5-2, I just had a feeling it was that there was going to be excitement. I never would have, will never say that I thought the Wild were going to come back and score 10, but I thought there was going to be some excitement in the third. And to see the things you saw, I mean, think about what it was. You had, you had three hat tricks. 10 goals, 17 total goals. You had two extra, two empty net goals, an extra attacker goal. You had four or five on three power plays for one team in a game. And these are things that you could watch hockey for an entire season. You might not ever see more than one in a game. You might not see one, period. And three hat tricks was the first time since 1992. That's. Just think about that. For Two a teammates I mean, getting six points in the same game, right. seven third in fact, period you, goals. I don't know if you saw it. Did you see the notes? On, I went back and looked at the box score from the 92 game, the last time there were three hat tricks in the same game. No. The Kings beat the Sharks 11 to 4. The Kings roster included Daryl Sador. Their goalie was Rob Stauber. Right. On the Sharks side, you had Brian Lawton, Dean Evason, <laughs> and there was one other Minnesota. Oh, uh, Dave Snuggerud. We're all on that Sharks team. So there are a lot of Minnesota ties to that game. None of them were figured in the hat tricks, but a couple of the hat tricks, Yari Curry had one of them. Luke Robitaille had another. It was it was just kind of funny to see those right. names pop up in that and game. And the two six points, first time since, also, I think, 93, uh, Sandstrom, Tomas Sandstrom and, and Wayne Gretzky. A uh, couple of good players right there. Um, you know, Eric, that, that line actually was held in check uh, pretty good the first two periods yesterday, then they, yeah. they broke well, out. Well, you know, I, I've had a lot of respect for that Lowry line uh -huh. all season. And last night, Ryan Carter and I were talking about it before the game and said, I really thought it would be a night where Hines might break that line, even though they've been going great, just because I thought the Lowry line was going to be a really difficult matchup. Yeah. And it was. I, they got outplayed yeah. by that line throughout the night, throughout most of the night. And then when you're trying to come from behind, you have to lean on those guys and you have to go mm -hmm. back to them. But I really thought that it might be a night where he just said, all right, as much as I love this line, I got a checking line. Lowry is their equivalent of Eric Sinek. Eric Sinek, a little yeah. bit more of a gifted scorer, but man, is he a handful to play against. Yeah, I covered his dad in Florida. And um, I'm telling you, in first Florida? of all, yeah, his Florida number. Yeah, you, you, it was Florida. Uh, number 10, Dave Lowry, left wing. Uh, not a center. Um, and he did not have the uh, he was very much like his son, um, but didn't skate as well. And probably not. I wouldn't say, um, you know, as uh, there's some skill to Adam's game a little bit. Um, but Dave, in the 96 playoffs, everybody looks at that Panthers team that went to the Stanley Cup finals and thinks, you know, all right, they had Scott Mellenby and Ray Shepard and Marty Straka and and and. Rob Niedemar almost said Scott. Um, the guy that led them in scoring that entire playoff was Dave Lowry, uh, led them in goals. So, uh, you know, he is he has great pedigree. And I think the thing about Adam right now is he has finally found his 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 stature on that team. I think it took him a while to really find this when, when you had all those stars in the top two lines. I don't think people nearly respected his game, but he has grown into one of the best checking centers in the league. And then you put a guy like Nino on his line, who's an analytics. We both we both know he's the guy has just always been an analytics star, and was a part of a really yep. good shutdown line here when exactly the, the Wild used him with Halla and Pominville on what was their shutdown line. Yep, Torchetti for, for put a, it together for right? an entire playoff season. Yeah, and they were really good. They scored mm -hmm. as well. So it, we've seen him in that role before. Appleton, to be honest, I, I don't know a ton about him as a player, but he sure looked good last night. And. The one I thing thought, I remember I about Mason, that line just got the yeah. better of Minnesota's yeah. best line. For so two PA periods. used to do the hundred dollar bill on the uh, scores table at uh, Vox in the Box at XL Energy Center, and uh, and if you put the puck through the the camera hole, which is actually the hole that the referee would talk to the official scorer, he would pay you a hundred bucks. And uh, Appleton's one of the guys that that has pulled that off. Like Andre Kopitar is another Ben Sherratt, uh, but I was there when Appleton did it, and <laughs> they were trying to figure out who the heck the guy was. Um, 
So, uh, and he scored, obviously, as you said, the back-breaking goal uh, yesterday. Marco Rossi downgraded to the fourth line. Any uh, idea why that would have been? I actually think it was, I don't know that I even call that the fourth line. Mm-hmm. To me, the it was really the third and fourth were somewhat interchangeable. The Dewar duhame Goudreau line ended up being a line that they used less. Mm-hmm. But I, I think going into the game, and even the previous game, when he had Hartman down there, it, he used both of those groups. And I, the way Lucini and Letary have played together, I think it was as much a, let's put Ryan Hartman up with a couple guys, see if we can get his game going. But let's put another speed guy with those two, with Letary and Lucini, and see if having three guys that play with pace together can ignite something. And, and they had a lot of good shifts. If you look the night before, the, we talked about it a little bit going into the Winnipeg game, that if you look at the Vancouver game, Yes, it was the top two lines that had all the points, and a lot of it came on the power play. Their best two analytics lines were the third and fourth lines. They were they were both like 70% and expected goals for at five on five and had some really important shifts in that mm-hmm. game when the Wild were down and they all of a sudden forced Vancouver's top line to play in their own zone for an entire shift, got the Wild scorers an offensive zone faceoff to start. So, And I think that was the same way that he used him. Now, one of Rossi's goals came on the power play, but I thought his game was really good from the start. And, yeah, absolutely. And wherever I, he was in the lineup, yep. I don't think it mattered. He yep. just keeps playing the same way. I've gained a lot of respect for that, the consistency in his game, whether he's scoring, not scoring. It doesn't seem to affect just the way he plays. You're such an analytics nerd, by the way. Well, 10 7 game. Oh, the, the expected goals. You know what? I like the actual goals. Well, the, the actual, actual 10 goals, they goals had that 10. happened in that. Yeah. And the top um, line had 16 points, but a lot of that came on the power play. <laughs> I'm and just kidding. The, um, I, so we were just looking yeah. at it because after the word you said, boy, it felt like those two lines had some important shifts. Yeah. We went back and looked at it, and sure enough, the top line was like 40%. Yeah. You know, the, th- the thing also I, I do wonder and I'll, uh, you know, the one, the one thing because the game was it was a weird game yesterday. And, and since Rossi scored two goals, I really didn't even ask John about what his thoughts were and, and rationale and reasoning for putting him on the Lucini and Letary line. Uh, but I also wonder, to your point, I on just Ryan, told you why he did. Yeah, That's what but, he I'm, I'm, but I'm just talk, talking about Ryan Hartman. I also wonder yeah. if he thought, you know, he'd be dragged into into the fight just because. You know, he'd be a little motivated playing in Winnipeg. You get him with that line. JoJo has yeah. not been going well. A little bit, um, but I think Hartman, I thought, had a good game against Vancouver, and a lot of it came mm-hmm. on the power play, but he had a lot of touches, and I think you just saw some things, a little bit of a, of a upward movement in his game, and I think it was the same thing. Let's put him with a couple of guys that play with a little more tempo with Zuccarello and Johansson, and maybe we can get Hartman just simplifying things. And I, that line was Minnesota's best last night. Yeah, was, they they dominated every shift all night. They played against the Shifley line a fair amount, and they had the better of it. Yeah, JoJo though, I mean, my God, he's he's colliding with teammates. He's missing open nets. He's fanning on shots. Like, like at some point, like he's got to score. Right? I mean, at some point, he's got to yeah, do he's something. He's in a tough stretch right yeah. now. It is three points in thirteen games yeah. or something, and two of them were goals against yep. Washington. Yeah, they need more. They need, and he's not the only one. They need more from uh, some of the veteran guys. Freddie Goudreau had his second point in what nineteen games yesterday. Yeah, and boy, he just nothing goes right for him right no. now. How about the shot Laterry had that had uh, Brossois looking behind him when it was five three? I thought that was kind of it was no, it was Rossi's shot actually. Was Ma- it? Jerk? He took the shot and and Brossois spun sideways and it, okay, thinking and he's looking behind him. And it was, and because it was Gaudreau, you knew the puck wasn't going to come yeah. through. If it's somebody yeah. else, the but puck in the just second period, there. same thing happened. Uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we're on Bruce a was, shot going the yeah, other way. Yeah, like the left side of the net is open. He hits the right post um, with Brassois looking behind the net. Um, so interesting game. This is a huge week coming up. I'm back to back games in Edmonton and Seattle. This stretch where they play Seattle, Nashville, and St. Louis. I mean, talk about make or break your season. You're playing the teams right there with you. And yesterday again, a bad ga- a bad day for them. L.A. wins. Uh, St. Louis is idle. Nashville winds up winning. What a what a week for Andrew Burnett. How about this guy? He, they lose 9-2 to Dallas. He gets so pissed off, he cancels the team's trip to they They played at St. Louis. Then the team was going to go to Vegas and have two days off there. The, the players bought tickets to the U2 show at the Sphere, was going to take the staff. He was so pissed at the 9-2 game. He cancels the trip to Vegas, brings him home from St. Louis, practices them. Everybody's pissed off. Then they go to Vegas yesterday and beat up on Vegas in Vegas. 
Like if they win in LA, you almost got to stop off in Vegas and say, okay, have your night. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it's, yeah. it was, it, it, it's so tight with yeah. all these teams, right? There were what last night going into the game last night, there were five teams within three points for the eighth spot, the second wild card, And LA was only four ahead of that. Yeah, this is a huge stretch. I, we have Carolina at home, right? Yeah, in between, between the, uh, the but in between but Seattle. Seattle and Nashville, St. Louis. That that might be the stretch that defines it. Yeah. If you win those games and you beat all the teams that are in the hunt with you, if you lose all three of them, it could be the end. If it's somewhere in the middle, then you know we just kind of keep plugging along the way it is. Yeah. It could be a defining week for without a doubt. And the way the Wild are playing right now, I mean, he, you know, five one and one. It's I think it's real. It's not it's the, the these aren't fluky wins that they've mm-hmm. had. They've been the better team in most of those games. Yeah. I mean, uh, they've played really well since the trade deadline, obviously winning in Chicago, which was not the greatest game. But I think they got the John Hines's message after the game. Came out, played well against Pittsburgh uh, and then obviously big wins in Vegas and Arizona and against Buffalo. Um, Well, they lost to Buffalo. That one. Have we talked about that, by the way, on this podcast? I can't. I don't think we have talked about a blown opportunity there. Yeah. It. Anytime you get a game that goes into OT like that, you know, is it a lost point or a gain point? And on one hand, yes, you had a lead in the final minute. It's a lost point. Mm-hmm. The other hand, you were behind in the third period. And anytime to me when you're behind in the third period, if you just say, hey, we'll take a point right now, everybody would take it. Yeah. And they were behind in the third. They, they found a way to get a point. So it's, they gained a point. They also left one on the table. So you can look at it both ways. Uh, three games now for Declan Chisholm. What are your early impressions? Liked him the first two. I didn't like him as much last night. Then I thought he got better as the night. I, he out. did get better as the night before. And and so, to me, I always when something goes bad for a player, I always look at what preceded it. Yeah, he took the penalty that led to the one nothing goal. The Wild had four chances to clear in that shift, what, starting with a boldy turnover. Right. And although he had one of them, yeah. And he just he was mishandling some pucks early. I think he was nervous and, early. I think so. And, and then, but I thought he got penalty. much better as he, as the game went on. And, he can uh, skate. Yeah, he can skate. He's, I think he's a smart player. He's got some smoothness. Obviously, we got to see a lot more of him. Uh, you know, I remember a guy named Josh Dobbs looked good early for the Vikings, too. And didn't, didn't exactly end that way. Um, how about Erickson next season? 28 goals now. His career high was 26 in 77 games. 28 now in 55, uh, I believe. Um, I mean, just, just and coming off the broken leg, I mean, it's it's pretty impressive. And it, as we've talked so many times, it's all the little things he does every night. Game never changes, nose to the net all the time. And now all of a sudden, he's he's scoring those goals, but he's also adding some skill plays. Yeah, and he's not just along for the ride with those two guys on his wings right now. He's contributing. He's making plays to set those guys up. How about the backhand saucer pass he made in the Winnipeg game? It, I think. He's just starting to gain confidence skill wise and and there aren't very many nights where after the game, no matter who the coach has been, they've <laughs> said, Well, Jewel Erickson got away from his game. Yeah. It just doesn't it does happen. It does often. not happen. He's a special player. We have a microphone up on here. Um if you want to come up up, don't be shy. You can come on up uh now. Again, March thirteenth is our next uh live show. Uh that is up at Split Rocks in Wyoming. Uh, definitely come on out. We got the grain belt special, which is a cheeseburger, uh, fries, and a, a pint of grain belt and the worst eats in the house. Pint glass for twelve dollars and ninety nine cents. Uh, and then it, we'll be back here at Elsie's uh, March twenty seventh. Uh, so definitely come on down. As you know by now, I'm a big, big, big fan and proponent of Livia Weight Control Centers because I'm also a client. Well, I've got some big news. Livia, the trusted leader in weight loss, is now offering breakthrough weight loss medications in their center locations. In fact, I was down at the Roseville location last week, and I met with Dan, Marie, and Amanda to get info for myself, and they were so excited with the number of people coming in for their consultations to see if the medical weight loss program would be the right thing for them to complement the work they're doing on the nutrition side of their journey. Well, Livia's new medical weight loss program offers GLP-1 medications that will support you in overcoming those bi- biological barriers that can make losing weight so difficult. Trust me, I know with my early mornings, my late nights, my endless number of flights, 
it is absolutely hard. Well, with this medication, you can eliminate the food noise and experience accelerated weight loss and decreased appetite, and you get all that alongside award-winning expert nutrition and personalized one-on-one support that you've come to know from Livia Weight Control Centers. I've been with Livia for six weeks, have lost close to 20 pounds, and already feel better in so many ways thanks to the expert nutritional guidance and personalized one-on-one support that I was just talking about that I get weekly from Livia. Livia. Visit Livia.com, that's L-I-V-E-A.com, or call 855-GO-LIVIA and find out more about their groundbreaking medical weight loss option. And if you're interested in the nutritional side only, well, good news. If you join Livia today, you'll get your first three months free. Be sure to mention my name, Russo, when you call in or fill out the form on the website, and the fine folks at Livia will get you all set up. Start your weight loss journey the Livia way. Hey, everyone. Attorney Jerry Bosch here with Bosch Law Firm and WorkCompExperts.com. For almost 30 years, we've represented Minnesotans just like you all over the great state of Minnesota to guarantee they've been treated fairly and with respect when they've suffered a work-related injury. A work injury can change your life in an instant. You need someone on your side who can help you focus on getting back on your feet and getting paid while you do. You may be entitled to medical benefits, wage loss benefits, job placement, retraining, and payment for permanent disability. To make sure you are being paid all the work comp benefits you're entitled to, please call the attorneys at Bosch Law Firm. The call is always free, and there's never a fee unless we recover benefits on your behalf. Call 651-333-8300, Bosch Law Firm, or visit us at workcompexperts.com. Boy, we haven't seen you in a while. What's going on? I shaved. <laughs> now it's you look good. Thank you. What's up? It was good to see you at Dead Man Winter the other night. Oh, yeah, yeah. That kind was of weird, awesome. Yeah, great show. You know, you fellas were just talking about uh, the next three games, key key time for the Wild, uh, possibility they could do well, Midland, or less than well. Uh, if it goes poorly, then does the club become a seller, and who would be candidates on the Wild to be traded? And and then also any comments that you'd have. You know, we've heard a lot of talk about Flurry, and he's declined. Like, he's not going to sell out on his guys. He's not going to leave. He loves it here. Um, is there really a team that would use Flurry's skill set right now? Yeah, so, I think so. Yeah. I think Colorado could use some help. I mean, it, the question is, what's his role there, and is Flurry going to be willing to accept it? Because obviously, if you go to Colorado, you are still going to be back up to Gorgiev. Um, but Carolina's obviously got goaltending issues. I think they're going to want to see what's going on with Freddie Anderson now that he's back practicing. New Jersey's got goaltending issues. Toronto's got goaltending issues. So I think there are teams. It's just whether or not that team is going to make him the number one, and then whether or not he's going to you know separate from his family to be the, be uh, the second guy. Um, you know, to our, to our point before, I think things are going to have to go really, really south um, for them for Flower to believe at the trade deadline that this, that he's going to want to leave this team that they don't have a shot. So if they're three or four points out of a playoff spot, I don't think flower is going to want to leave. And uh, I had Bill Guerin when I filled in for Barrero on Sunday sermons the other day, and he said, plain and simple uh, that he will call the shots here. So whatever flower wants, he that can flurry get. would. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah that flurry would um, in terms of who goes, I mean, obviously Maroon's coming back from the back injury. Uh, he's not going to be back until after the trade deadline. Doesn't mean he's not tradable, but his value obviously is going to be hurt a little bit by that. We have to get the word on what Bogosian, what happened to Bogosian yesterday. It didn't look good. Um, but Bill Guerin, again, on the radio the other day, told me that he wants to resign and bring Bogosian back. So I don't think he's somebody that he wants to trade. I mean, the, the guy the, the guy that I think might be a hot commodity that would uh, a lot of teams would be interested in is Brandon Duham. You know, you have a, a guy that big that could skate, um, add some skill, is willing to fight, uh, could kill penalties, uh, is 27. Uh, to me, he's probably the biggest name uh, that the Wild would have to to maybe move right now. Yeah, I mean he's a he's a supplemental part. Or yeah, piece I mean they're not they not, don't have anybody that's going to be able to a, trade first round. Pick right, a blue chip guy out there that's going yeah. that they're going to or whom they could command a lot. I think it would have to be a really dismal stretch. I mean, we it would have to be five losses yeah. in a row right now that knocks them ten points back. And but again, uh, they're uh, gonna they're gonna be in the yeah. hunt. The, they're that if you really look at. Minnesota's season, I think it's interesting. Go to the coaching change. They went eleven and three, and now in this last stretch, what is it, nine, four, and one? You combine those two, that's twenty wins, seven losses, and a and an overtime loss. 
the middle stretch, one seven and one, with all those guys out, with no Spurgeon for most of it, with no Brodine for all of it, with no Kaprizov for most of it, no Zuccarello for part of it, no Felino for most of it. That stretch has put them in a bind in the standings, but it's not indicative of what the team is. So I think when you look at what's ahead from here to the finish, you have to look at what the team's done when intact. And if you expect them to play at about that pace the rest of the way, none of these other contenders are anywhere close to that. And they've all been healthy for the most part. Nashville's been healthy. They, they aren't playing at that pace. St. Louis isn't. Seattle isn't. Calgary isn't. And they're likely to sell. So I, just, I think when you look at it, it's really unlikely that the Wild are going to find themselves 10 points out of a playoff spot. I just don't see any of those other teams stringing together a stretch good enough to run away from the Yeah, these next LA, five games. LA are... is the one team that I think has the ability to play better. They showed they it early in the year, and they've just started now. They've also shown the ability to drop 10 out of 11. So yeah. it, they, it, but I think they're the one team that has the talent to be to separate themselves from the rest in this wild card race. But again, you know, de- to your question, I mean, definition of a seller is not like your normal. Like they don't have Chris Tanev and Noah Hannafin and yet you know Jacob Markstrom. That's selling. Those that's a real seller. If the Wild sell, it's going to be little pieces for little pieces. Uh, you know, that's just that's kind what of the happened. way they kind yeah. of the way they bought last year. Yeah, exactly. And and uh, you know, uh, and and we knew that was the case if this scenario happened the second they signed uh, Zuccarello, Felino, and Hartman. If Zuccarello, Felino, and Hartman were still pending you know, unrestricted free agents, there would be a lot of intrigue going into this trade deadline. A lot, you know, because I think any team in the league would want those players. Um, and it would obviously change the complexion, not only just of the assets that you can get back, but the future of the wild. And now that that obviously isn't going to happen. Any other questions? Here we go. Line up. What's up? Hey, Anthony. Yes. How did you call a game last night with that girder in your way? <laughs> he a- maneuvers the freaking camera to make it like the girders in the way. No, it, have you walked in there? I've walked in. I've done TV in there. You, you, you can move away and see no, down if, by that net. If, you, if I stand where I am, the girder is from just inside the blue line to the top of the crease. It, literally, if I stand. If I sit, the monitors are this tall. I can't see any of the ice. I stand anyway, so that doesn't matter. But some of the other guys who have gone in there, sit, they really complain because they can't sit down. So every time the puck would go this direction, I move probably about this far just to, well, Ryan Carter's standing right here. That's all. It, I mean, it really is a, it's a workout. It, it's, a, it's not a workout, but it's, a, it's really a pain in the neck, and it's, it's just ridiculous that you would set it up that way. There are other guys up there that don't need to see the ice in a blink of an eye. For, like, for example, the some of the team staff, they're in the booth next to us. They don't have a girder in their way. and But the guy who needs to see it fast, and there are a lot of plays where the puck goes in a corner, and if you don't get down there fast enough, like, I, I can't see now who has it, and I'd find myself just looking up the scoreboard monitor to see if they had a shot of the jersey number. So you, you there's a, San Jose has one too, but that's the worst in the league. And I actually point, tweeted that to Randy Hahn the other day. He tweeted the girder, and I yeah. said they're just trying to make you feel like that you're at home. Yeah. <laughs> but Randy Hahn is the Sharks play-by-play guy for TV. Well, and the, a good friend of mine is the Winnipeg radio guy, so I go in and give him grief every time I'm there that we're going to construct a girder in the XL Energy Center just so that we can make him move around while he's doing the game. Yeah, It's, it's not ideal. And, and just uh, actually to your point, um, the Wild do purposely do not put media in front of the visiting TV booth at XL Energy Center just out of respect because they don't even want like people to stand up in front of these people. So, I you know, I mean, it, like, like, but I, I mean, you put that, you, you know, you put that and compare that to what, you know, visiting TV people have to deal with in Winnipeg. It's kind of uh, funny. I will, I will say, let me add one thing to our next game is the worst broadcast position in the NHL. Edmonton. We go to Edmonton and we're about probably a half a mile away from the ice surface. Mm-hmm. We are so high and so far back. And then they wear like the, their uniforms look like you're taking a colorblind test. Like it's orange and blue. So it, the, you, you can't see them. Eights look like sixes and nines. I mean, cause it's just a big glob. And I think we're on level nine there. Yeah. It's level nine. The view and the calling point is so bad that the home guys moved down to level five because they couldn't see. 
And so every time I walk in there, I said, well, how is this allowed? Like you guys say it's so bad that we've got to move our guys down four levels so they can see, but you guys just go ahead and call it up there. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I, I texted Jack Michaels last time we were up there. I said, hey, just shoot me a text if somebody scores, will you? Because I probably won't notice from up here. Yeah. Hey, Michael, you were uh, up in Winnipeg. You drove. Yeah. Why didn't you just keep going up to Edmonton? Uh, because Joe's doing that. Uh, we were not originally covering the uh, Winnipeg game uh, because the flights are so expensive. Uh, Delta just pumps them up. Um, it was also mercy for Dylan. Yeah. Who had uh, so, to drive with him to Winnipeg. Yeah, well, I would not have gone unless some, unless Dylan or somebody came with me. I would not have done that round trip uh, that long alone. Uh, I needed somebody to annoy. And, and Dylan heard a lot of me. Especially today, I had like meetings and calls, and and I, I finally turned to Dylan like when we finally got back to Minneapolis, and he was working on his laptop. I'm like, I am exhausted. I got a sore throat. I've talked to like 50 people today, but um, but to that we were originally not covering it. I was covering it back here, but the, it's so expensive to go to Winnipeg that we've missed the last two games, and as we both actually the last three, and as we all know, Kaprizov got hurt in his last two visits, and the whole Ryan Hartman Perfetti thing, and I finally said to my editor. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to drive because I wasn't going to spend $1,400 for a regular season game. That's that's stupid. Now, you are right, though. If I if we had done this at the very beginning and I went Winnipeg, Edmonton, Seattle and back, it would have actually I mean, the way it works with airlines, it would have cut the thing in half. Um, but uh, Delta to just do a round trip to Winnipeg. It was it was insane. OK, so. yeah. One thing about team with Brock Faber. Are we going to have the uh, Joe Maurer of the Minnesota Wild with him? Hometown boy, goes on the hometown team, stays there his whole career. Uh, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. It winds yeah. up a first ballot and, Hall of Famer. Yeah, first ballot, take first ballot yeah. Hall of Famer. Yeah. I, think, I think they'll take it. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, he certainly seems happy here. Well, and, let's put it this way. His next contract will be eight years. So that gives you that gives you 10 in a wild uniform. Yep. So um, actually, not, uh, he's got one year left on his deal. That So that gives you 11 if you include last year. So there's 11 right there. Thank like, you. I, I promise you his next year, his next contract, I think it's, it's going to be eight times eight minimum, maybe eight times nine. Do you think he'll be the best number seven Minnesota born player by the oh, time he's career? <laughs> that's tough. He's a Hall of Famer yeah. now. Yeah, that's tough. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I don't think he's that's likely, but he still has to play more games to catch up to Nico Sturm in my eyes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, they're ever. It's funny every time the the Wild wear the old green and golds, the North Star names pop into my head when I see those guys and Broughton. Every time he's got the it just even though a totally different player, I just see those numbers and it's wild North Star players' names that pop into my head immediately. More about Flower. How cool is that for Minnesota experience, his milestones? Tell us a tidbit that you haven't already talked about, wrote about, future Hall of Famer, prankster, Mr. Positivity, awesome teammate, good dude. Any tidbits to share with us? About Mark? Yeah. Um, I don't have any. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I've written 15 features on him already. But I will tell you the one thing, like I, I witness it a little up close every time we travel. This guy is, none of it is fake. He is very real, the nicest human I've ever met in the National Hockey League. And he he stands like he's the last guy grabbing his suitcase off the bus. Yeah, He stands at the bottom of the stairs going up to our charter jet when we leave and lets everybody else get on before him. When he climbs on the plane, he is, it's yes, sir, no, sir, excuse me, let me, you go ahead, get by. It is... You would never guess that he's the most tenured guy in the in the league on that plane. He's he acts like he's the youngest rookie on the club, and he treats the rookies with a ton of respect. He's just a he is a first class all American guy, even though yep. he's not American. And reporters too, you know, it's just he's he's a remarkable guy. And to your point, um, I think it is. I think it's a privilege for all of us to get to watch this, and I think it says everything to to Anthony's point that he was traded here embraced be em, embraced being here like he loves playing for this team um and wanted to break his records here and and appreciates all this organization has done for him and you know every time i look for him uh, you know even listening to him last night and and um him just constantly praising the way that the team played you know i i just really uh, have 
you know, at the beginning of the season, I was convinced he was retiring after this year. I just am not sure anymore. I just cannot imagine this guy next season, what he would do without. It just doesn't seem love. like it's yeah. right for him to be away from the yeah. National Hockey We're League. doing a really cool wild player poll. And uh, and just to give you one thing, like he didn't win the category, but we have one category that's, uh, you know, who's most who's in the gym the most. I was shocked at how many people say flower. So that also just tells you how a 30, you know, nine year old, right? 39, 50. Anthony. Anthony? Yes. Um, yeah, 50. Um, you know, how, why he could play at such a high level this long. And he, he's just in, you know, perfect shape, keeps, works his butt off. And that's why he's here. And he obviously loves the sport. You know? Uh, thank you guys for doing this. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Love the jersey. So when we talk about numbers and we see the number 20, um, we don't Maroon. think of Suter, do we? I think of Cicerelli. Cicerelli. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, um, you know, you guys have been in around pro sports for many years. Some of you started in Florida. Um, uh, really? Uh, uh, of, of some of I your... I covered Dino in Florida. <laughs> so, so of some I watched of, Dino in Minnesota. So of some of the, the players that you've covered, either in baseball or hockey, are there any ones that are really special to you that you may have a special autograph or memorabilia from them? Or if you don't have it, is there somebody that you wish you would have? Well, the jersey that you're wearing, Dino Cicerelli, is the only autograph I've ever gotten from a player I covered in the history of my uh, career in 29 years covering the NHL. Isn't that crazy? So Dino Cicerelli in 1998 scored a 600 goal with the Florida Panthers against, um, against the Detroit Red Wings in front of Scotty Bowman, which was hilarious, by the way. Um, but it's 599th. Um, and I could be actually getting them mixed up, but his 599th was uh, uh, against Dallas Stars, his old team, in front of Darian Hatcher. And we had an incredible, incredible picture on the front page of the Sun Sentinel to go with my game story. And the next day of practice, Dino came up to me and said, hey, that picture um, that was in the Sun Sentinel, is there a way that you can get me a, a copy of it, like a glossy, you know, on the, I forget what they call that, the white, you know, uh, that you would make like almost microfilm for a newspaper. I forget what they call that. Um, but he asked for a picture and I said, um, I'll actually, I'll, I'll, I'll tweet this out tomorrow. Um, and, um, and he said, can you get me a copy of it? And I said, oh, on one condition, if I make a copy for myself and you autograph it. And, uh, it's the only autograph I've ever gotten. Uh, it is frowned upon for people in our business, uh, media credentialed media people to get autographs. In fact, almost every credential that I've ever seen on the back of it says no autographs, please. Um, so I don't. So I definitely defied, uh, uh, you know, the rule there. But um, the only other autograph that I do have uh, actually came from Mike Madonna at the uh, number nine retirement cell ceremony in Dallas uh, five or six years ago. Uh, the Panther, the Wild were the were the team that the retirement ceremony happened. And I get up to um, and I barely knew Mike Madonna at this point. I mean, I'd known him over the years, but I didn't know him. And uh, he came up to me in the press box with a the Mike Madonna book that the Dallas Stars came out. This unbelievable giant book of his career with articles and pictures and and everything. And uh, he gave me a copy of the book. And inside was a card that he had written to me, thanking me for you know support over the years. And so those are the only two autographs that I ever gotten in my career. One I asked for, one it was a gift. Uh, you well, it's interesting that you, the tide of flurry is interesting because. The, the night of his ceremony, we all got a numbered pass that was one of whatever that was in the building that night. And a, what the towels that they gave out, I had one of those. And I had left them sitting on our dryer. And Margot asked me, said, did you keep those for a reason? I said, I don't know. I just kept them. She said, well, would you ever want to have him sign them? I have zero autographs. I have none. I mean, I, like, I got Hank Aarons when I was a little kid or something. But I have none that from my time covering athletics. And I said, well, if we got it signed, who would we give it to? And so, I don't know, somebody that's a big flurry fan. That, I mean, that's the way, like, we just don't have that kind of stuff. And there are a lot of guys that I've covered that I now get to work with. And those are some of my favorite guys, but it's not like autograph type things. Like, I love working with Justin Morneau. He was one of my favorite twins. And for me and for anybody that was a Minnesota fan during those magical 87 and 91 runs, that I get to sit and work with guys like Roy Smalley and Tim Laudner, Kent Herbeck stops by to visit with us. And just to listen to it, I'm a little kid in a candy store listening to those stories. So for me, those are special. None of them are autographed like things, but you know, I, I, 
go play golf with Justin Morneau sometime. I mean, this was one of my favorite players when I was watching. And, and so the, I have those kind of memories, but not, not memorabilia. It, yeah. But, same, same here. Like when I covered the Panthers, um, you know, I was grew up a huge Islander fan and Bill Torrey was the president. Billy Smith was goalie coach. Danny Poppin was their color analyst. Dwayne Sutter was assistant coach or getting somebody, somebody big too. Um, and, and it'll come to me, but, uh, you know, I go there and I'm just in awe of all these guys, but my memory, my like best memories of, and that to me is what memorabilia is. My best memories are just getting to hang out with these people, traveling with them, you know, renting a Chevy Malibu and <laughs> renting a Chevy Malibu in, in, uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And, and, uh, you know, going, uh, going to a movie with Randy Moeller and, and Denny Potman and Billy Smith and, and, uh, Jeff Rimmer, who of course had to be in the front seat and looking in my rear view mirror and seeing Denny Potman's mug in the middle seat of my back seat. Like that's to me a memorabilia, right? I mean, that's, that's a, that's a memory that I'll always remember. So th- that to me is, is the cool part of this job. And, and, um, in fact, I'm, I'm friends with this, t- the flurry thing just reminded me that I've become friends with, the, you've met him, uh, the server at Mastro's in Vegas, and he's a giant Vegas Golden Knights fan, season ticket holder. And there's another server that works at Mastro's in Vegas that's an incredible painter, artist. And Mark Andre Fleury is the other guy, the guy that I'm friends with, uh, favorite player when he played with the Vegas Golden Knights. So he drew him this incredible, like, custom made uh, picture, this painting of Mark Andre Fleury making this incredible, incredible save with the Vegas Golden Knights is one of these quintessential things during their, their one of their runs. And, uh, and I actually took a, he sent me the picture. I sent it to Mark. Mark was absolutely humbled by it. Actually asked if like he paint one for me, but uh, this is like a year ago, but the other day, like in January when I was in uh, Vegas and I went out to Mastro's, he asked me, is there any way that you could ask Mark, like when he's in Vegas next time, if he'd autograph this for me. And I said, honestly, I'm not comfortable doing like it's just not it's just a conflict of our of interest it's just nothing that you know that we would be able to do you know so like i felt terrible about it and i guarantee you if i said to mark can you do that he would figure out a way to get it done but it's just you know so it's just it's frowned upon let's put it that way so thank you thank you for sharing the stories yeah hey there can you believe we're only halfway through winter Brace yourselves for some good news that'll warm your heart. It's the perfect time to bid farewell to that tired old furnace and AC. Dive into the cozy embrace of a brand new, high-efficiency, whole home heating and cooling system from Aquarius. Picture this. You can have it installed now, and guess what? You won't pay a penny until next year. Yes, you heard that right. Not a single payment until 2025. Head over to AquariusHomeServices.com to schedule your free comfort estimate. Financing offers are subject to credit approval. Trust Aquarius to be your cozy home companion, ensuring you stay warm and delighted all through 2024. Aquarius believes earning the right to be recommended. They're just click away at AquariusHomeServices.com and don't forget to mention Russo sent you. Open a 5.15% annual percentage yield 11-month certificate at any royal office or online at rcu.org slash financial journey C-E-R-T. Early withdrawal penalties could reduce earnings and principal APY accurate as of 2 24 insured by NCUA. Well, hopefully everybody was at the last show at Tuttle's because Ryan from Huxley Optical came and gave away a bunch of Brock Faber swag that was very generous of him. And Huxley is more than just the official glasses shop of Brock Faber. They're a local small business that makes glasses for the whole family. If you need prescription sunwear, gaming, or office lenses, Huxley can help. They'll even put new lenses in your own frames. Huxley's experienced staff knows what looks best on you and is happy to help you find a pair you love. Huxley is so good at what they do, they've even picked out a pair of glasses for me. It fits perfectly, I look stylish, and it was so, so easy. Huxley makes shopping for glasses easy for everyone. The folks at Huxley know what they're doing, whether you need glasses for your computer, sports sunglasses, or an everyday pair. Huxley can help you find something you love and save you some money in the process. If, in fact, Huxley Optical is here to help you get more from your HSA and FSA flex banding accounts. Find out more today at HuxleyOptical.com or go to their Roseville or YZ locations. Dylan, you want to talk about Winnipeg? Oh, here sure, we go. go. Here, here we go. Yeah, yeah we got to tell you. Do you know that Winnipeg was Dylan's first time ever out of the country? I did know that. I had dinner with Dylan. Oh, yeah. You were look, You were watching other people in the restaurant. Dylan well, and I we were. were I, you guys <laughs> seem to not understand yeah. what was going on around us at this restaurant. Yeah. We'll uh, actually talk about that. What's up? 
Uh, I'm like LaPanta. I have not been to the dentist in a while. <laughs> Hoping for a good luck next time I go there. Perfect. Good uh, luck. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, I have a few different questions I could go. I have a uh, trivia, work, or hockey. Do you have any? Uh, you can go for all three right now. It well, seems light on the questions. Today. All right. Well, we'll go with uh, hockey first. Uh, last night, going back to last night's game against Winnipeg, uh, we pulled the goalie with down by two. Yeah, a little over three minutes left. Face off in the zone. Top line out. Rested. Um, Patrick Waz back in the league as a coach. He's the one who started pulling so early. What do you think? Like, what does that do to the players? Pulling the goalie down by two. 314 rested top line. Why not try to get one on that first face off in the zone? Right, yeah. I mean, in this case, they were down by two. So I think that's the big reason. Okay. You know, when you agree, I, the, the times that I did that I don't like it is when they're, they are in that situation and you're, and you're down, um, you know, you're only down one. Sure. I, and uh, especially on a power play, a lot of coaches will do it on it. Even if you're down one, like four minutes left, 350, whatever, pull the goalie. And that's when I really hate it because then the other team can, shoot at the empty net without icing. Yeah, I thought Vancouver should have pulled the goalie on the power play when they were down two. Yeah, down two makes before. sense. I, I, I thought it was a hair early last night, but I, I think it was all set up. The shift before, Hines had played the other guys, so he had those guys ready. It's an offensive zone faceoff. He still had a timeout. So I think he was thinking, I can double these guys up, get a minute out of them here. After a timeout, I can get another minute with them. And you were facing a goaltender that was pretty good. So I think he was just felt like in most other games, Hines has been a little, he's been much later pulling the goalie than Everson ever was. And so that it surprised Everson me a little would pull bit. pull the goalie like down three, you know, it's like, what are you doing? Right. But he would do it early. Yeah. And, and he'll, and then if they gave up a goal, he wouldn't even put him back in for the faceoff at center. Cause he'd say, what difference does it make if they get another one? I want six guys to win the faceoff. Why wait for possession? to do it and so different guys have different philosophies that last night i was a little surprised they went that early i like it i if i'm down two what difference does it make i i guess i want to use all 315 if i can uh for your work uh russo you started and joe smith started doing the uh, takeaways on top of the gamer this year uh just wondering uh what why? like what yeah yeah kind of why uh like i enjoy it but like it seems like a lot of extra work for you. Yeah, actually, I do. You know, it's funny because obviously when I was at straight, when you're at a newspaper, you file out the gun because the goal is to get something on the website right away. And I think we started to see it change a couple of years ago. We started doing this in just playoff games. And, and I was doing it during the Easter Conference and Stanley Cup final last year. And I finally said to my editor, you know, maybe we should give this a try this year. Um, it's good when things are, you know, set like last night where it's tough is like Joe the other night when it where there's records and goals and comebacks like the buffalo game my thing exploded you know like the my whole takeaways were declan chisholm scoring the winning goal and, and then it just blew up in my face and now i've got a one rewrite then they score immediately to begin in third so you, it's just a lot of thing but our metrics at the athletic really show that we're missing out like people want to want it's not even want to read immediately after a game they want to comment they want to comment with each other they want to have a place to go. Um, and so we felt like we were sort of really, one, letting the audience down, the people that subscribe, but two, kind of missing an opportunity to, rather than having everybody wait till two hours after a game. And a lot of times, we, you know, we have our universal desk after, say, 11 p.m. Central, which is every time a story is going to be in. And they've got, you know, they, they sometimes, if you're counting all the pro sports, baseball, basketball, football, sometimes all, I'm sorry, hockey going on at the same time. They might have like 40 stories coming in on deadline at night. And so I could file a story at 11. It might not get up till 2 a.m. So that, what good is that? So this way, now we get something up at 940, 945. And now it gives some people something to read and something to comment on for the next two, three hours until the actual article will get up. There have been two or three occasions this year, one because of travel on the road, if I remember. Um, and a couple where the games were just so nothing that we just went with takeaways only, no gamer. There was a game fairly recently where on that day, for, I can't remember what was going on, but I wrote like five articles that day, and I finally said to my arm, just writing about the game, the takeaways and leaving. Um, so that, that you know, and that is the point of it too. We are the only market at the athletic that one travels every place, but two writes after every game, and so. 
it was it's also a way that our editors are trying to give Joe and I the license to not feel like after every game we have to write a gamer that at least if it's a nothing game or we've got something else going on that we could just sort of uh, work on that other stuff and be a little more efficient um, and have something on the page and not feel like we have to write a gamer. And this way, the, the people that subscribe to us are getting something and not complaining that they haven't at least got something. If that makes sense, sense. So. for uh, for the sake that makes lots of sense. But for the sake of some people in the comment section, maybe you could hold off and they would have time to think about uh, what they comment. before. Yeah, that. I know. Yeah. It should, like uh, like like players and coaches, there should be like a cool down period. Yeah, or, something. Yeah, exactly. or some or just ignore the comments. Yeah. All right. Uh, two quick more ones. All right. Uh, Lapanta, your job. I'm always looking forward to the uh, 14, 10 and six minute mark. Uh, hit the head, grab a drink, <laughs> something. Uh, what do you during those times? What do you do during those times? Uh, it's only lot, 90 seconds. Right? Yeah. A lot yeah. of times it's it's some quick research on what's coming next. And the most of like for my prep is done before the game. But then it'll it'll be a quick discussion with. I send. I send a file that might have, I don't know, how many do you think are on there? 20, 20 charts. graphics for every game, full page graphics that we might use four of them, might use eight of them, might use 10 of them, just depends on the day. So a lot of times it'll be like, hey, can we use this? And then the producer will talk to the analyst and he's, okay, you want to talk about how efficient Jonas Brodine's been coming out of his zone. We got this clip, this clip, this clip. Then we could tag it with the, the graphic that I've built that talks about the wild here is where the wild rank and efficiency getting out of their zone or something. So it's a lot of quick organization for what's going to come out of the break. And sometimes it might be, all right, Kevin's coming out of the break and he's, I'll want to know what he's talking about. Just so like, in fact, as an example, last night, I think it was, he was talking about girls section or girls state tournament for hockey. Why? Well, as soon as I, okay, that's what he's coming out of break with. Well, I got to quickly, I, I'm not up on the girls hockey <laughs> tournament. So a quick call up to the page, just so I could make sure I knew who was in it. If it was, I don't know how he's going to throw it to me. He might say something with, and you know, Anthony Benatonka is back for the fourth time in a row. I mean, he just, well, I want to have something I can add. So a lot of times it's just some quick research and quick organization about what's going to come out of the break. Football and uh, football four quarters makes sense. Soccer two halves makes sense. Oh, Hockey no. with three periods. Uh -huh. uh, why? Yeah. Um, I, th I mean, I, I really actually don't know the actual answer, but my guess would be that they realize that you can't, you need to have to resurface the ice. Um, that would be the biggest reason. I did look it up and that's what it was yeah. originally was two halves, but yeah. there was too much. It is snow. unbelievable how eaten up an ice will get. And, and I've learned that because and how different it is at the end yeah. of the period. Yeah. Like um, I, you know, one of the cool parts of covering the Stanley cup finals, which I've done many times and this changed, um, in the mid two thousands, I can't remember when and why. Um, but it's it's after you know they they parade the Stanley Cup around. They actually have the media and cut go on the ice and interview the players rather than and then the locker room is totally for the players after the game. They get to celebrate. It, they have cameras obviously and stuff, but they don't have to deal with any print media. It's it's their party, and I love it because one we get in we get the players quicker. But the one thing I've learned when we started doing that, and the first time I ever did this was in 20, uh, 17, 2016 was the Nashville San Jose series, and 2017 was, was Nashville Pittsburgh. But the one thing I realized is just walking on the ice after the game, you might as be walking on a dirt road. It is so eaten up and everything, and, and it, it's just crazy how quickly 20 minutes of hockey will turn that you know fresh sheet of slippery ice into something that you could – you know, do wind sprints on and not even fall. So, yeah. Although actually in, in San Jose, uh, when, uh, when I bet uh, somebody could fall. Yeah. I bet. I, <laughs> well, here's the question. I'll never forget this. As long as I live San Jose, Pittsburgh series, Pittsburgh wins the cup. They open it up for all of us. And not only do media go out there, but celebrities do Cuba Gooding jr. Just went belly, belly up like ass over tea kettle. Um, but he also might have about 17 whiskeys in them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I did look it up. And it here. happened right behind me. It was crazy. Catch him. Yeah. Uh, it used to be halves, apparently, but then they decided it was too much snow. So yeah. then they changed it to two intermissions to resurface. Yeah. But I think it should be tri periods rather than <laughs> periods, just doesn't make I don't know. Yeah, yeah, periods. I get you. Uh, what's up? You always have the coolest jerseys. How many jerseys do you own? 
Uh, as of today, two more and another one coming. I, <laughs> I order them from like a cheap website and that's how this came about. It came without the G in Spurgeon. So I took the nameplate off and put my own on it. So, so is it like a Fanatics jersey? It's un, unmarked. Okay. Un, Cause yeah. usually it's, it's Fanatics that misspells uh, nameplates. So I think this was like a, like knockoff of so Jesus or something. Like the wrong team winning the Stanley cup type jerseys. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Like, it's bad. Uh, I was going to ask you guys about the, uh, the high school tournament. Um, how come, well, high school in general, LaPanta, how come Valleys didn't do any, um, like, high school games this year? It was, well, this year, we, last year we got back to it, which was great. We We're lucky it. they do and, professional games yeah, right now. Right now, this year, I don't, know if you, I don't know if you've heard, but my company's bankrupt. So right now I'm just happy the key card works every day when I swing into the office and uh, I, hopefully it's something we can get back to, but it, it's not a moneymaker for us. It's a losing proposition. And, but yet we've been able to convince our bosses over the years to dive into it. We, we did a pretty big package a few years back where I think we had 30 games, including football and hockey. And I loved it. I always am lobbying for it. And I, even last year when they came and said they were going to do them and I said, I'll do as many as I can, as many as fit when I'm home and off, I want to do them. And, and they were like, really, you still, I said, absolutely. I want to do them. So I, I miss covering high school hockey significantly. So I, I wish we could do them. I'm hoping maybe next year we'll be able to get back to it. Do you think the tournament could generate any like revenue for a bigger uh, company? Like, something like an ESPN two broadcast. Cause I always hear people down in like Florida, Arizona, like people watch from all over For the place. Our, the state tournaments. Yeah. Well, this, the, we don't have the rights. The state tournaments are owned by channel 45. So the, there was a time they used to be on channel nine, which was owned by Fox. And at that time I worked for Fox sports North. So I, I was able to do the tournaments when they were on channel nine. I did the prep bowl for, I don't know, maybe 10 years. I did the hockey tournament for a couple of years, basketball for maybe six or eight. But as soon as I went to Channel 45, that's a competitor. So we don't have the rights is the short answer. We would love to. I think we would love to do that, especially now with our extra channel where we'd have a place to put them. And who knows, maybe the next time they come up, our company won't be bankrupt and we can start to order some pens and everything. It'll be great. <laughs> do you guys oh, have a, a pick <laughs> for either the tournaments or a uh, team you're following? I haven't seen enough of Minnetonka. The, let's go Skippers. Yeah, Ooh. well, Minnetonka is really I, – I, I haven't seen a ton of games. I've watched a couple online, but those teams in the late conference, it's unbelievable how I think how much better they are than the other teams I've seen around the state. Uh, Tonka, Wyzetta, and Edina, I've seen a couple of the overlapping games between them, at least parts of them. They just look like they're playing at a different – different level but what's interesting i did you got six of the top eight teams in the state are in two sections so at max you're going to have three of the top eight in the state tournament which is too bad yeah uh dylan was telling me today that international falls beat or international falls got beaten by hermantown 14 nothing it was like 65 to 49 the shots 65 to 9 oh 65 to 9 okay so nine save shutout yeah Okay, yeah, it was and that's not as impressive as I originally thought. I thought you said yeah. 49. All right, there you go. 65 to 9? Yeah. Uh, yeah, in fact, that prompted a story where somebody brought up Neil Broughton earlier, and it was, I read a quote afterward that Broughton had said that when they were in the first round of the sectionals, they were so much better than another team. They were ahead, I want to say 12 nothing after two or something, and the coach told he, his brother, and Butsy to go take their skates off. They weren't playing anymore. Wow. Didn't even have a yeah. dressed for the third period. That's something. What's up? This is a NHL question, and it, I've been following the league since the North Stars were here. I had season tickets for every season. All of a sudden, I've noticed watching some other game that whenever a team is on a power play, they kind of throw the puck back to a f forward that's flying in. When did that all start, and does that really help? We, or? Uh... We just had an article written about the uh, genesis of that in the athletic um, about uh, I can't remember, I think it was Lazarus or somebody wrote it uh, probably about a month ago. Uh, I will send that to you. Um, I mean, the, the goal of it is to come in with speed because it was stopping defensemen essentially from lining up at the blue line. I will say Brock Faber needs to get better at it. Like he just he he 
His drops are off target all the time. They call <laughs> no, it, not even off target. Yeah. He but like it, yesterday there was one play where Boldy had stopped at the like far blue line to get the puck, and that yeah. defeats the purpose. And it does. It's called the double drop. And yeah. the, the theory is that the first wave comes with speed, and if the defense doesn't honor that, they carry it in. But if you drop it now, all of a sudden you've pushed the defense back. And yeah. now the second guy has a little bit more speed coming in and it's harder for them to recover. Yeah. That's the I think it's been going theory. on about 10, 12 years. Yeah. Is that yeah. for yeah. some teams? Now almost yeah. everybody uses yeah, now some everybody form does. of it. Yeah. Thank you. Brock, yeah, he needs to get better at it. Um, so uh, so Dylan is Dylan Laux is who we were talking about. Uh, you can read his work in the hockey news. Um, so I was trying to tell him during this, uh, because this is his first time that he's ever left the country. That every city outside the United States is like Winnipeg, wouldn't you? Very agree? similar, yeah. Yeah, sandy, windy, dirty, <laughs> a couple four-story buildings, smelly. Yeah, it's uh, it, Winnipeg. Is, it's tough because I I spent a lot of time in not a lot of time, but I spent I made frequent trips to Winnipeg back when I was covering the St. Paul Saints, and I made the bus trip up there a few times, mm-hmm. so I know what the drive is like. And in the summertime, it at least then. It was actually a cool city. It was sunny almost all the time. It's one of the sunniest cities in Canada. And the ballpark is cool. It's right on the water. There's an area down there by the water called the Forks that used to be kind of fun. A lot of outdoor bars. There's a little Italy neighborhood that's that is cool. That's pretty cool. It's not bad. But the downtown area is just dreary and dismal. And it they haven't recovered very well from the pandemic where it's it it was always sketchy and now it's like a ghost town. And what we experienced at the shark club the other night, which I'll never go back there ever <laughs> as long as we travel. It, it was, I mean, it was terrible cocktails, terrible service. She table was, mean, was dirty. Man. She was inconvenienced every time you tried to get her attention. And then just kind of random drunk people vagrants just, off the street. Yeah, it was crazy the restaurant. It was, um, but I will say there are some really cool places. I, I've spent a lot of time in Winnipeg, especially because I covered the 2018, their uh, 2018 Vegas series there. Um, after the 2018 Wild Series that obviously uh, we all know too well. Um, but um, and I got so I got to spend a lot of time in a very good weather in uh, some awesome restaurants going out with a lot of my friends that are in the media there. And some of the national broadcasters are there and things like that. And there are some really cool places. We've gone to that Wellington, that Wellington restaurant. That's I've gone great. to. There's a couple Italian yeah. spots. And they have this now new Italy like North, North Garden. Like. I forget what they call it. North Garden. Some they have this new sort of like, um, really high end, very attached to the arena. You know, take the Skyways, um, area there that have awesome restaurants. But they that I don't know if I've ever brought you there. We, uh, but Pizzeria Gusto, which is on the outskirts of town, they now have, uh, Gusto North in this place, and you would have loved it actually. So uh, there are nice, nice places there, and the buildings are uh, unbelievable as well. So, um, but um, you know, every single place is like Winnipeg. Dylan. <laughs> Imagine being your first time ever out of the country. Yeah, and it's to Winnipeg. Winnipeg. Yeah, there aren't a lot. I of did cities. tell him, I'm like, you have to go to Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary. To- go anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Except maybe just- Edmonton. Edmonton's not much better. I like Edmonton. It's you're good. you're you're down on places that put sand on the. I ice. don't like sand, and it, I know that <laughs> it's that uh, people don't have a choice, but they it's sand instead of salt. So as soon as it gets snowy and then melts, it's just everything is dirty. It is unbelievable how dirty it is. Yeah, like yeah, just. Uh, I don't know what they do. They just throw sand around, and they must just leave it there till May or something. Yeah. Because there's also there's got to be a thousand cannabis shops there. It, yeah, I've never seen anything smells. like it. Like I've been to Denver a lot. This place, and it, you know, the, it's the only downtown that can't support Starbucks. I know there's, there's like no... three of them that are closed, yeah. and the ones that are open just randomly close in the middle of the day sometimes. Oh, it's ridiculous, right? Oh. And then when you ask somebody, like, where do I have to go to get a Starbucks that's open? Well, on a Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> what? Tuesday. On a, like what? Um, I will say there's not enough Starbucks between Winnipeg and Minneapolis. We need to add some Starbucks. It needs to be something off the highway in Grand Forks and another one right off the highway in Fargo. And then be- there, there's nothing between Fargo and Alexandria, not even a gas station. And you get to add Alexandria, there's no Starbucks. St. Cloud, you can't find it. we got to get some Starbucks on this drive. Yeah, well, you should get a better Google Maps because I happen to know there are some Starbucks in some of those cities. I passed St. John's today. 
Yeah. It needs to be right it off just, the highway. It just, I, I stopped at a Starbucks in Moorhead It's a mile today. off the highway. I, I was so jonesing for a Starbucks today that the I'm telling you, this the Americano I got at the Moorhead Starbucks was the best Americano I've ever had in my life. Did you just feel a little good karma when you drove by Collegeville? Yeah. Yeah, I was, uh, I was, I was Such looking a for happy the whole place. I was looking for the Lepanta statue. Well, you should have stopped and said hi to Ariana. I figured that that you've spent enough money on tuition there yeah. that there should be a Lepanta statue. It should be, and that, you know, so the funny thing is, they keep coming to me and asking me to donate stuff. I was like, donate stuff? Yeah. How about you got a tuition check coming in like a month? Can yeah. that count as my donation? Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Brandon is literally packing up as we are recording the show. <laughs> yep. I think he's telling you that was that was my sign. He's, this is it's like the the Academy Awards music is being played right now. <laughs> like when he starts taking the the uh, mixer that is on and putting it into the bag. <laughs> any other questions, Dylan? You don't want to promote your uh, your work? Nothing. All right. Uh, March thirteenth at Split Rocks is our next live show. Uh, March twenty seventh. Uh, at Elsie's, we'll be back here. Can't wait for that. Uh, a couple more shows uh, just during the wild season, but then, uh, as you know, we do it all off season as always. Thanks for coming on out here to Elsie's. Thanks to Grain Belt and all the Tuttle's restaurants for always having us. Thanks uh, for joining us at the Aquarius Home Services Studio and Aquarius Home Services, your local authorized dealer for Connecticut Water Treatment Systems, uh, heating, plumbing, cooling, electrical. They do it all. Uh, Royal Credit Union. Huxley Optical, I love Huxley, uh, Livia Way Control Centers, Bosch Law Firm, and Twill in the Adina Galleria. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. So much coming out, there's nothing going in. I know that you feel like you're never going to win. Oh, but the world won't forgive. There's so many things that everybody that listens to this podcast knows that pisses me off about LaPanta. <laughs>